from an industry segment perspective the growth for the quarter was led by bfsi and healthcare life sciences which grew by 6.9% and 6.1% respectively on a year on year basis the growth for bfsi and healthcare life sciences were 15.9% and 24.9% respectively the growth in technology companies which include the largest customer was 2.7% for the quarter and 22% 22.8% for the year on year basis. So overall, across board, we saw a fairly healthy growth on a year on year basis and even on a quarterly sequential basis. From a service line perspective, all the service lines did well for us. The growth was led by digital engineering, cloud, security, data, all growing meaningfully in Q4. Turning back to our two organizational units, technology services came in at a revenue of $120.7 million with a sequential growth of 8.2% and a year-on-year -year growth of 22.1%. For the full fiscal FI21, the technology services business registered an industry leading growth of 18.4%. The Alliance business was subject to the traditional Q4 seasonality, as you would all know. It had a degrowth of 7.1% quarter-on-quarter, coming in at $32.2 million. However, on a year-on-year -year basis, compared to Q4 of last year, the Alliance business showed a growth of 40%. For the full fiscal FY21, the Alliance business generated a marginal degrowth of 2.7%. Despite this marginal degrowth, we are excited about the progress that we have made in this business in the recent times. We've also bagged a couple of large deals over the Q3, Q4 period for us, and that gives us confidence in the ability to bring a predictable, profitable growth in this business going ahead. The year FI21 has also seen us optimize the cost in this business, and we will continue to figure out avenues of doing cost optimizations in the IT business wherever prudent. In summary, on the Alliance business, we are prudent in adding profitable growth, and we are optimistic of continuing that on an online basis. Turning back to the update on ESG initiatives. As you know, Persistent has a long standing history of embracing strong corporate governance, CSR, and employee best practices. We are in the process of appointing an ESG consultant to define the ESG roadmap for the company and start measuring against the standard ESG framework. And we'll give you more details in this regard in our annual report for FI21. Now I'll turn the call to our CFO, Sunil Chakar, to give a detailed color on the quarterly and yearly financials. I'll come back after Sunil's comments to give you more details on key client wins, other awards, recognitions, and a few more data points. Over to you, Sunil. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, and good evening, good morning to all of you. And I hope you all are keeping well and uh, staying safe in this challenging time. Uh, Sandeep has already given you a fair amount of details on the financial stuff. I'll give you some more uh, details on that. So, the revenue number at 152.82 was a QOQ growth of 4.6% in dollar terms and 20.3% in uh, y -Y term. On the rupee revenue, we had the growth of the rupee revenue was 11,134 million, the growth of 3.5% QOQ and 20.2% YOY. So while there was a dip in IP led revenue due to the seasonality as Sandeep alluded to, the strong growth in services revenue absorbed this dip and we were able to post a net growth of 4.6%. For the full year, the total revenue was $566.08 million with a growth of 12.9%. And in EP terms, it was $41,879 million with growth of 17.4%. If you take the uh, uh, segments that we have in terms of the IT-led and services business, the services revenue grew by 8.6% and the IT-led revenue had a decline 13.8%. In terms of industry vertical, BFSI and healthcare saw good growth of 6.9% and 6.1% respectively, while the technology company, where we have the nesting of the ISV business, grew at 2.7%, essentially because of the seasonality in the IP led business, which gets accounted over here. In terms of linear revenue, the offshore revenue, linear revenue grew by 11.2%, all accounted due to volume growth. And the on-site linear revenue grew by 4.2%, comprising of volume growth of 5.4% and decline in bill billing rate by 1.1%. As you would be aware, we had a pay hike uh, announced in November uh, 2020 for all the employees. 
So last quarter had two months effect of the pay hike. The full effect of the pay hike has come in this quarter. We added 1,242 net employees in this quarter to build capacity for growth and service some of the existing uh, this quarter's growth. The royalty revenue being lower also affected the gross margin to some extent. And then there was currency movement which also impacted margins to the extent of 40 basis points. So cumulative impact of the headwind were partly compensated by the organic growth. We saw significant growth in the services business of 8.6%. The fact that the resale revenue was lower and we also optimized on the IP person month. And from an overall uh, deployment point of view, there has been increase in the offshoring effort, which you can see in the person month data. So all these margin drivers taken together had an impact of 40 basis points on the gross margin, which came in at 33.9%, 40 basis points, lower than the earlier quarter for 34.3%. The SGNA expenses were 17% as against 17.3% in the previous quarter. As you will recall, we had announced uh, COVID relief donations of Rs. 250 million at the start of the year. And we have by now contributed Rs. 170 million during FY21 towards that. The EBITDA for the quarter was 16.9% as against 17% in the previous quarter. And for the year, it was 16.3% as against 13.8% in the last year. Coming to depreciation and amortization, it accounted for 3.8% as against 4.3% in the previous quarter. The EBIT came in at 13.2% versus 12.7% in the previous quarter. And for the full year, it was 12.1% as against 9.2% in the last year. So over the year, uh, essentially, you would have observed improvement in EBIT. Treasury income for the quarter was Rs. 211 million as against Rs. 288 million in the last quarter, primarily on account of M2M adjustments on mutual fund investments arising from increasing yields that happened in the month of March post the union uh, government announced, union budget announcement of significantly higher government borrowing program. The product gain was Rs. 174 million due to the M2M gain of budget as against a loss of Rs. 2 million in the previous quarter. With that, the profit before tax was Rs. 1849 million at 16.6% as against 15.3% in the previous quarter. The ETR for the quarter was 25.5% and PAT was Rs. 1378 million at 12.4% of revenue as against 11.2% in the previous quarter. PAT for the full year was Rs. 4507 million at 10.8% as against 9.2%. 5% in the last year. EPS for the year was 58.97 per share, with a growth of 32.9% by a The operational capex for the quarter was 281 million. We have cash and current investments on books amounting to 19831 million as compared to 19037 as a 31 December. As you know, we had interim dividend payout that happened in the month of February. Uh, to be 14 per share. Uh, forward contracts outstanding as at 31st March was $135 million at an average rate of $77.11 per dollar. The board has recommended a final dividend of Rs. 6 per share, and this, along with the interim dividend of Rs. 14 per share, would make the total dividend of Rs. 20 for the year with a payout ratio of 33.8%. So with that, I would like to thank you all once again, and I hand it back to Sandeep. Thanks, Arun. So now to give you a color on key client wins for the quarter, our best leads for the quarterly return carry the details far more than what I would give here. For the banking financial services and insurance segment, we were chosen by our leading Fortune 25 financial services IRC as a key partner for core IT modernization. This is a three-year deal to support and maintain proprietary identity and authentication products for enterprise applications, involving both offshore and nearshore teams across concerns. We were also chosen by a large insurance company 
for the credit union customer segment to deliver retail experiences and build a cloud based data and analytics platform this would be helping their customers be insights as a service and build customer data warehouses for better decision making in the healthcare and life sciences segment we were chosen by a leading us health system to help them build a digital front door and patient experience solution with integration to emr systems and patient portals this will enable the health system to build a unified one patient portal simplifying visit processes enabling a single view of patient across departments and ultimately delivering consistent patient experiences we were also chosen by a leading global clinical research organization eros as we call them in the healthcare space to help them execute on an enterprise wide legacy modernization program leveraging new soft and intelligent business automation on the software high tech and emerging technology we were chosen by a global technology leader to partner with them on an engineering and go to market partnership on a portfolio of security products this is a five year multi million dollar deal to develop identity and access management product portfolio with delivery teams spread globally across us uk and asia We were chosen by a leading low-code technology provider, a unicorn in the space, to establish an engineering and professional services center of excellence, helping them build industry solutions and deliver transformation programs for their customers in healthcare life sciences and banking financial services domains. Moving on to the awards and recognitions for the quarter, Q4 saw us get recognized from industry-leading analyst firms and associations on multiple fronts. To mention a few. We were awarded the coveted 2020 Golden Peacock Award for excellence in corporate governance, an award that we are extremely proud of. We were named to ISD Booming 15 Global Standouts in sub-billion-dollar category fourth quarter in a row. We were named as a rising star in ISD Provider Month for healthcare digital transformation services. The Avers Group named us as a rising star and a major contender in peak metrics for software product engineering services, as well as major contender in intelligent process automation provider landscape. Constellation Research named us to their shortlist for innovation services and engineering in Q1 2021. All of these are testament to the capabilities that we bring to bear with our customers on a daily basis. In terms of the partner system, the ecosystem highlights. We were chosen by NAFCO, which is National Association of Federally Insured Credit Unions, as a preferred partner for digital transformation. Through this partnership, credit unions will have greater access to our credit technology services and solutions to accelerate digital transformation, including expanding the use of cloud-based products and solutions. We announced a partnership with Green Market, point-of-sale lending for banks and credit unions. This partnership is aimed at enabling. Small to mid-sized financial institutions across the globe to accelerate their digital lending strategy. The joint solution offering between persistent and thin market will empower community banks and credit unions, enabling them to seamlessly enter the point-of-sale lending market by directly originating loans or providing new pass capabilities for their merchant customers. We have partnered with AWS Rosa. on the red hat open tech platform to bring services on the aws solution to clients seeking a fully managed open tech platform coming to our leadership team updates we continued to add to our leadership muscle during the quarter we announced stefan that in the list as our head for salesforce business globally stefan had joined the assistant as a part of the european acquisition and he will now lead our salesforce business to globally be part of europe We also added Dean Dow as the head of Europe, based out of London. Dean will be responsible for all our business across Europe. With this addition of leadership and promotion of Stefan, we will have leadership from Europe for global business, and we will have leadership being brought in for Europe in Europe. We also added Jadi Dhok as head of delivery for BFSI globally, and Namit Narula for BFSI for East. So we have been consistently adding the muscle to take on more. and continue the growth journey that we have established for ourselves in summary we are a strong q4 and a good growth to fy21 we are optimistic about our growth potential in fy22 with this i would like to conclude the prepared comments and like to request the operator to open the floor for questions thank you operator thank you very much we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchstone telephone If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking questions. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. To ask questions, please press start and one. The first question is from the line of Apurva Prasad from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Mr. Apurva Prasad, you may go ahead with the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for taking my question and congratulations on, on the strong quarter. Uh, so, Sandeep, a uh, 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 couple of questions actually. Uh, is the renewal component within the uh, uh, the TCB uh, part uh, is that in line with the prior period renewal rate? So, so say first half and and prior to that, and and uh, related to that, if if uh, you know if I go by the recent deal wins uh, that has been announced, uh, you think those are good to keep uh, growth rate in the top end of that three to four and a half percent Q1 Q range? Yeah, so coming to your first question, see, typically the renewals for some of our large customers are in the October, November, December quarter. That is where they do the annual renewal. And so the renewals that happen in this quarter are in line with the forecasted or budgeted renewals. So no, no worries on that and no worries on the new renewals. Now in terms of the growth trajectory, if you look at it, look at it this way. We are doing $152.8 million in revenue for the quarter. The ACV value that we have said is 200.7 million for the quarter. Anything which is above or in the vicinity of 1.2 to 1.3 times the ACV is a fairly good number to have. And keep in mind over the last five to six quarters, we have done many deals with our multi-year deals. The renewals for those will not be due for the next few years. So we are very comfortable with the booking profile. And as long as it is in the vicinity of 200 million, even TCV, plus minus a little bit, we are comfortable with a 3 to 4, 4.5% four quarter on quarter on an average. Obviously, some quarters could be higher, some quarters could be a little lower. But we are comfortable with the order bookings. We are comfortable with the order bookings translating into the you know, trajectory that we have established for ourselves. And thanks for the clarity on that. Uh, uh, so, on, on the alliance business, I mean, with respect to Red Hat and Cloud Tax opportunity, just wanted to pick your brains here. So, uh, I mean, uh, IBM has talked about mid to high single digit growth in Red Hat, you know, with hybrid cloud adoption, especially as, you know, IBM is undertaking an overhaul in their own go to market strategy, especially mid market. Do you think that translates into sort of incremental uh, drivers uh, from a pers persistent perspective and maybe across different components within the alliance piece? Just your thoughts here will be useful. Right. So, so on the first part, does the Red Hat opportunity, the Red Hat growth, whatever IBM is projecting, give us a growth opportunity potential? Absolutely. So, for every dollar of Red Hat that IBM generates, the potential for us to generate revenues is multifold. It could be anywhere between two to three, three and a half times or times. So, from that perspective, the market opportunity is right. And you know, one of the partnerships that we also announced was between AWS and IBM. Red Hat OpenShift, that's where we are playing. So we are also looking at the various avenues where Red Hat is expanding and how we you know, sharpen our pencils on our service side and that. So, so that definitely is an opportunity. Overall, also, if you look at it, not just the you know, cloud pack, which includes the Red Hat and so on, but otherwise the cloud pack for security, the cloud pack for data, Nine yards is where you know we are looking at different opportunities, and we have a healthy traction in that. So, from an alliance business perspective, we have made sure that it comes back to the same humming nature in terms of pipeline and so on, and we are reasonably confident it will deliver growth. Great. And just finally, uh, uh, bookkeeping one, what's the drop in the segmental margin uh, in the BFSI and healthcare life science attributable to? So. For some of these, you know, quarter and quarter variations may be there. There are some client specific nuances as well. So there are some volume discounts, et cetera, that have to be given at some points in time in different you know, client bases. So I wouldn't worry too much about that on a quarter on quarter basis. Overall, both these segments are overall we are seeing across the company a good, you know, discipline on margin and we are trying to even take the margin up a notch as we go. Okay, thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dipesh Mehta from NK Global. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. A uh, couple of questions. First, about the SNM investment. If one looks, SNM is largely flat, even from employee perspective. 
for last two years or so. So now, do you think productivity-related improvement, what you might have driven over last few quarters, largely, or you think still there is enough scope to drive better productivity from the team, or you think now we have to invest in people and your S&M investment may start growing? Second question is about the deal sizes and tenure. If you can help us understand how it is changing, let's say over the last few quarters. Thank you. So on the sales and marketing side, we have driven good productivity from the investments that we have been making on an ongoing basis. And some of the things that also are helping us is as the revenue pans out, obviously that s and investment is being defrayed over a larger revenue base. Will we make additional sales and marketing investments? We'll continue to make prudent investments to scale as we kind of you know, go through our journey for the next few quarters, years, and so on. So there will be s and investments, but we are not expecting it to be anything disproportionate in percentage terms. I think we have a good productivity matrix established, and you know, we'll continue with this kind of a thing. So you should expect this to be in line in percentage terms. Obviously, as the revenue increases, that percentage translates into a little higher spend in dollar terms. Now, on the other side, the deal sizes. So look, the place where we play in. We are very strong in digital product engineering, in you know practices like Salesforce, low-code, no-code, cloud, data, and so on. Usually, these are places where deal sizes, if I look at the PCB, anywhere between 10 to $50 million is a sweet spot for us from a bigger deal perspective. And even for larger peers, I would tend to believe, unless they are putting in a lot of you know, support revenue along with you know, these kind of deals, these deals will tend to be in this kind of sizes and they will keep having phases. So we are seeing the pipeline, large and small both. The larger deals are anywhere between 10 to 50 on a TCV basis. So that's where it is. And the deal term can be anywhere between you know one to three to five. The bigger the deal, the chances are it will be a three to five year kind of a deal. Sure. Uh, just one clarification. I want about the weakness in a realization what we are seeing on site observe both. Uh, is there any element of reimbursement portion? Because I think the, def the definition suggests it includes contractual reimbursement portion. So is there any element of travel related uh, softness impacting your realization or it is uh, your realization group? Yeah, hi, Nipesh. So, uh, this is actually uh, what you call the realization. There are two numbers on site where we have had certain expansion in uh, revenue from uh, North America in other geographies like Canada and Mexico. So, you see partly one reason because of that. There is no uh, impact due to the reimbursement part that you talked about, and then it is more about the uh, you can say mix of the business. So far as offshore is concerned, uh, yeah, off, offshore is concerned, it is for this quarter slightly higher because of uh, the uh, revenue growth in the, uh, what you call, India business. Understand. So no travel related impact. It is largely business mix related implication playing out. There. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pankaj Kapoor from CLSA. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks for the opportunity and Sandeep, uh, congratulations on the consistent execution. I had two questions. Uh, first, if you can elaborate what kind of a uh, margin levers do you see uh, when you're talking about keeping the margin stable in 16 to 17% EBITDA band? And uh, I just added to that, uh, if you can talk about that, uh, maybe Sunil can help in understanding the amortization trajectory. That's the first question. Second question is on uh, your uh, contract. I believe uh, the $15 million contract that we announced uh, last year, I believe there is some restructuring there. And uh, uh, and I think the, the client has sold the business as per your release. So if you can just throw some, uh, some more light over there in terms of uh, what are the changes that it means for your business and uh, in terms of financial revenue. Thank you. Sure. So, on the first part on the margin levers, so there are 
So right now we have come to the 17% range for the beta part, and we are relatively confident of being there. That's count one. The underlying levels that we have there are three. Number one, in our IT business, there is certain amount of you know cost optimization we have done. There's certain more cost optimization that is possible in that business. Number two, the utilization. If you look at it, for us the utilization has dipped a bit for the last quarter, and even you know. From our overall perspective, we believe there is significant things that can be driven out of the utilization, and the utilization has gone a little lower because of the capacity build also that we did. If you look at the hiring that we did, 1,600 plus in Q3, 1,200 plus in Q4, all of that obviously takes a little time to kind of get to point. So there are levels on the utilization side as well, and then there is you know the SG&A investments being spread over larger revenue base that we already talked about. And then there are some minor operational efficiencies that we can bring in other functions and so on. So overall, we are confident we have enough levers to be able to take on any cost increases that may happen in other places and still be in a comfortable 70% plus minus a few bits here there. So that's the thing on that. Now on the second part, the 50 million contract restructuring that you're talking about. So this customer of ours was bought over by a large hyperscaler, and. In fact, that goes well for us. So, for the shorter term, yes, there is you know a contract restructuring that has happened, but that does not you know impact any of our next 12 months to 18 months kind of revenue outlook. And even within that, there are discussions happening of what more can be done in different forms and shapes, which we are very hopeful will continue the revenue at the same level, if not better. Second, it also gives us a bigger relationship with a hyperscaler where we did not have that kind of a relationship in the core engineering part that can be expanded to various other parts as well. So overall, comfortable with that, not a matter of concern at this point in time for us. So that is where we are on that contract. Hopefully, the two you know questions are answered. Yeah, thank you. And Sunil, the amortization piece, yeah, hi, Pankaj. So on the amortization, we have already got some benefit in this quarter. And uh, from next quarter, there will be release of another 50 basis points worth of amortization expense. So that will be the benefit from next quarter onwards. And that is something which we can assume to be the stable uh, uh, number uh, going forward, right? That is, it, yeah, understood. Thank you, and wish you all the best. Sure. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from Equitus Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and congrats, Sandeep and the team for solid execution, both on operations and consistent uh, deliveries as a whole. So, first question in terms of the order book, uh, Sandeep, uh, it's happening to see that 250 to 300 million dollar worth of TCV has been continuing uh, in Q3, Q4. So, you believe looking at the pipeline, uh, 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 there are prospects that uh, this number can be uh, sustained uh, on an ongoing basis, or do you believe? Uh, uh, These are aberrations, and these are much higher, and may not sustain going forward. So, the uh, the PCV part, I would say, it will fluctuate quarter on quarter. Some quarters are seasonally stronger, like after the end of December. Overall, if we are in the range of 200 to 250, in that range for PCV, that's pretty healthy. The ACV part would be obviously a component of it. Look at it this way: if we are doing 152.8 million dollars for the quarter. And if we are, you know, booking 20% or more in ACV terms, that itself is a fairly healthy thing, and we can translate that into TCV and all. So we are very comfortable if the TCV is in the range of 200 to 250 on the ongoing basis. Some quarters will be higher, like OND was in 300 billion range. Some quarters may even be lower. But if you look at a broader picture from a yearly basis, this is fairly healthy. And keep in mind, this does not include. Many of the deals that have been booked over the last five six quarters, which have three to five year annuals, which don't come up for annuals, which have no bookings in these quarters. So overall, fairly happy with the profile. And things may go up and down, but fairly happy with the pipeline and the prospects we have. Okay, okay, fair enough. Uh, just on the technology uh, vertical as a whole, uh, can you refresh in terms of the split of the business on the product engineering for technology client, which could be On the legacy products as well as on a new gen products, uh, because that's on the new gen product product engineering business is likely to see a robust growth as per what we read uh, on ongoing basis. 
so we don't call out that split, um, so, but we can get back to you on this number. A significant part of our business is on new product development. If I was to hazard a guess, it may be 65, 35 in terms of newer products versus you know older products being modernized or maintained. But we'll come back to you and we'll be in touch with you on this. Okay, okay. And this 65% new product or which you mean uh, would be largely digital products or cloud-based products? Absolutely. And even the, the other part, a chunk of that would be modernizing those products and enabling them in terms of certification or, you know, doing a hybrid kind of a thing where some part of that can be taken to the cloud and so on and so forth. So a significant part of even that would be digital in nature. Okay, okay, okay. And just on the alliance part, uh, this year we have seen a marginal degrowth and you have been restructuring and you were also winning the deal and you were earlier saying that from one few onwards growth may turn around. So is it fair to say uh, the growth rates may start inching up uh, in the alliance business to company average specifically on the services side of the business? Yes, that's a fair statement to make. See, if you look at some of the utilization related things as well. The utilization partly dipped because we had certain programs being ramped up on the alliance side and otherwise. So both the technology services and alliance had some newer programs where we were doing the knowledge transfer and you know doing the transition part for building newer teams and so on and so forth. So that will definitely bode well for the alliance business as well. And starting Q1, alliance business is also called for a good growth. So thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take the next question, we'd like to request participants that in order that the management is able to address questions from all participants in the conference, to please limit your questions to one per participant. Should you have a follow-up question, we request you to rejoin the queue. We take the next question from the line of Abhishek Shindadkar from Ilara Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and congrats uh, on a great execution. Uh, the question is related to mining. Now, uh, you know, despite the strong growth that we are reporting, it seems that um, mining is still an area which can add to, uh, you know, growth on top of the net new business that we are bringing. Uh, so any color on, uh, you know, how do we plan to improve that? And would that also mean that, you know, there are some tailwinds uh, uh, into the margins as we rationalize the client portfolio? Uh, the second question is just a bookkeeping to Sunil, sir. Uh, you know, the improvement in the DSO, is it something that, you know, we are consciously following up with clients or it is just that because of the shorter nature of the projects, uh, you know, we are getting uh, payments, you know, early payments or timely payments. Uh, any color on that would be helpful. Thank you for taking my questions. So, we should take the first uh, part and then I'll hand over to Sunil for the second part. So a fair statement that you know mining is definitely a tool in our toolbox, and we are being at it. We have formed you know teams which are transformation teams that help our regular you know account teams in thinking through what the clients' key initiatives are and help them with thinking through the propositions proactively, including proof of concepts and so on and so forth. So for FY22, this is definitely one of the key initiatives where we are expecting us to go deeper into existing accounts and that should start reflecting over the next you know two to three quarters in the client you know break into one three five ten twenty kind of you know revenue brackets so fair point and we are at it and we have seen early successes part of the consistent growth that we have had over the last five quarters or so four to five quarters has been on the basis of both the new wins in existing customers which are nothing but mining and you know, getting some large use in new customers. So we have seen early successes, but this is a place where we'll double down and deliver even better going ahead. So, Mister, if you want to answer the second question. Yeah, yeah, Abhishek. So on the DSO, you know, it is more a function of uh, actually the process efficiency improvement. Actually, if you not uh, look at it, whether it is a short project or a long project, ultimately the client is paying based on the underlying payment terms. So one is the process efficiency of entire order to cash cycle and the second is the sheer rigor in the system. We had also uh, been conscious of the fact that in this pandemic situation, 
it is more important that we have eye on the ball and ensure that there is no build-up of receivables at any place. So all the factors put together has led to consistent uh, reduction in the DSO. While if you recall in the first quarter, when the pandemic had started, we had actually DSOs going up because of the situation that we all faced, uh, lockdowns and so on. But then from there, consistently we have, so the first uh, move was to get back to where we were and then continuously we have been working on improving this uh, discipline internally. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rishi Junjunwala from IIFL. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, so only one question on on the renewals, right? Or basically your uh, 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 you know revenue portfolio. Um, how much of your revenues need to get renewed every year? In the sense, how much of it expires every year and needs to be refilled? And how have you seen that trend changing over the past few years? And probably I'm assuming that the, the component is reducing given that you are winning a lot more multi multi year multi million deals. Yeah, so, so this is a good question. From that perspective, look at it this way. Some of the largest corporations in the world, when you look at, let's say, one of the largest networking companies, one of the largest banks, the people who are, you know, significant to us, even the largest technology company, a, a bunch of their businesses, they do not give more than six months to one year kind of years, even though they have been working with us on the same thing for many, many years. So unfortunately, that is the nature of their working, and so that that we can't wish away. But to your point, we've been doing a number of large deals, so that proportion of renewal business on a yearly basis, etc., is you know going to come down. And we are hoping to announce the order backlog in the next quarter. So I would want to wait so that I can in one go give you the order backlog and all these things. Otherwise, the more incremental data points we give, we get more queries and clarifications. So if you can wait for one quarter, we'll give you the order backlog that will show you quarter on quarter movement as well, and that will give you a fairly good grasp on all the analytics you want to do. Sure, great. Uh, the second question is, uh, if you look at your headcount, uh, this year it has grown at 29%, whereas your revenue growth was only 13 um, So just to better understand, is, is this uh, significantly higher hiring? A function of uh, you, know, you doing preemptive hiring because supply could be an issue? Uh, and as a result, next year the hiring number will be much lower, or is it a clear reflection of uh, how much revenue growth you're going to do? So it's a reflection of two, three things. It's a reflection of the revenues to come, combined with more offshoring effect, combined with some amount of capability built ahead of the curve, combined with some amount of attrition that we want to mitigate should it happen. So it's a combination of a lot of these things but you pretty much got the factors right. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to participants to please limit your questions to one per participant. The next question is from the line of Madhu Babu from Canada HSBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Congrats on a great quarter. So just recently, one MidCap has done a sizable acquisition in the BPM space. And now that the cost of debt is very low and, you know, we already have a very good cash balance. So is it the right time to go for a sizable acquisition, maybe in the run the business service line or even on the consulting path? So from uh, an acquisition perspective, Madhuvalu, we are always on the lookout for good acquisition. And for us, the acquisition will not be to accrue revenue. It will be to accrue capabilities so that we become more sharper in the service lines that we have or the industry segments that we serve. And at any point in time, we are evaluating multiple of these, small to big. Hopefully, we can give you a meaningful kind of update in the next three to six months time. Because these things do take time, and we do have few things that we are evaluating, but you know, timing will obviously be over the next few to six months. Uh, and so the strong hiring we have done, so I mean, was it the decent markup we have given to them? Because in this pandemic, I think people are thinking twice before switching jobs. So we had a very good hiring. So just what is attracting them to persistent? And second, how is the outlook on the fresher hiring for next year? Thanks. Sure. So from a hiring perspective, look at it this way. We have been able to attract this amount of talent, you know, 1,200 
to you know 1600 people on a quarterly basis for the last two quarters this is on the basis of two things number one obviously we have revved up our hiring engine number two more importantly when we approach you know kind of the hiring panel that we want to hire the fact that we work on cutting edge technology the fact that persistent has always been known to be a good technology company good company where you get exposure to the data edge work and combined with the growth that we have shown consistently over the last few quarters you know both very well for us to be able to attract the best talent so from that perspective it also helps us not be attracting talent just because of the money we put out in the market but because of the credibility of the work that we do the growth that we have the career path that we can provide and the employee experience that we provide so that way it has been very helpful from you know that hiring you know ability and we have not seen that as being the money led path only and you talked about the fresher hiring so we hire usually between 800 to 1000 freshers on a yearly basis that would be the baseline for us we may go a little bit higher if we need to hopefully i answered your questions yes sir thanks and all the best thank you the next question is from the line of tapesh mehta from mk global please go ahead yeah thanks for providing another opportunity and just want to get your uh, sense about whether we are seeing demand you know remained accelerating decelerating stable and i am asking this question in the context of if i look over revenue growth we hit 20% yoy yoy considering strong dealing take pipeline as well as airlines business likely to recover uh, entering into fy22 uh what challenges you think let's say to sustain 20 percentage or you think it is sustainable and likely to play out over medium term thanks so the way i'm not going to answer the question on 20 percent because if i say 20 percent is sustainable or we will do more i'm giving forward in guidance if we don't do i will basically say that look we have established a good trajectory for ourselves we have executed with discipline over the last four five quarters we have been in the range of anywhere between three to four and a half or more we would be in that range some quarters will be higher some quarters would be lower that is as far as that is concerned as far as the demand environment is concerned see the demand environment for our services has been fairly good for the last few quarters and that's what has you know what it went for us and our competitors peers whatever you know on the call for the last many quarters we see that as a stable environment and when i say stable it means a good secular environment of growth for us potential for the next two to three years so that is where we are and uh, you know unless something goes here or there the environment from a demand perspective is fairly healthy it's about us to you know go and execute and some quarters will be higher for us in terms of order bookings because it takes a lot of effort when you are fighting a good you know set of deals and then you win some you lose some you clear the pipeline again and you do that so overall stable confident of our growth and that's where we are so hopefully that answers you is that answer is only uh, airlines i am not very clear you indicated airlines will return to uh, growth like services in next year uh, we seem to have lost the line for mr karla please stay connected while we reconnect mr karla participants please stay connected while we reconnect the line for mr kalra so we have mr kalra reconnected sorry i got dropped so dipesh you were saying something yeah sandeep i was just asking you made a one comment about airlines business where you uh, suggested Uh, revenue growth trajectory likely to converge with services business so do you expect airlines business to reflect similar kind of growth trajectory entering into next year so it is start picking up towards that direction and you know obviously we have seen fairly high growth in the services business so that average of 2 will be in the trajectory that we are talking about and incrementally we will see more and more hopefully in the next business but we have good you know other bookings to be able to stay with confidence Balance business is going to be back on growth trajectory, and we have to build it up from there. 
Understood. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Manik Tanija from GM Financial. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Sandeep, I just wanted to pick your brains about the willingness from customer standpoint to pay more for skill based uh, uh skill based on based on skills rather than location and given the fact that even in our case we have seen a significant increase in offshore mix of revenues over the last 12 months and i the reason why i asked this is because in our case we work with a lot of new age isc customers so uh from that standpoint are they much more open to doing development work offshore uh, that's question number 1 the second thing where i want to wanted to understand is that given the current outbreak of covid how is it impacting the delivery for you guys uh, over the last few weeks thank you sure. so on the first part uh, is the customer willing to pay more based on skills rather than location so yes and no ours is a fairly competitive market if you look at it we compete with peers globally whether they are you know india headquartered eastern european headquartered us headquartered or broadly global majors right so while yes the kind of work that we do enables us to get a little premium over here but we have to be cautious about you know saying that yeah just because of covid and location independence people have seen in this we should be able to get the same kind of premium that you know we can get in the us and so on or rates closer to the us or europe and so on so there is definitely a premium we can get for our business but it will not necessarily be a huge thing because it's always a competitive market second part from the current outbreak for covid perspective so thankfully we have not seen any degradation so far in service delivery all our teams have stepped up all our team members have made sure if at all there is anyone suffering in their teams and there are some teams where people are suffering they have stepped up to take on each other's work and usually we have a concept of you know shadow resources as well we have bring we have got that to bear we also have used our bench in some cases so overall we have been able to make sure that even in the past 5 to 6 weeks where we have seen the covid you know second wave become pretty you know big in india we have not seen service delivery to them so that's where we are hopefully that you know also sure thank you if i can ask one more just wanted to pick your brains regarding the the uh, onshore utilization and given the fact that that was that has generally been cited as or suggested to be a source of uh, margin improvement from a medium term standpoint how should we be looking at the decline in onshore utilization in the recent past is it just a function of the supply side creation or uh, there is something else to it yeah so there is there is multiple parts to it if you look at the on site part of it we use the onshore team members in multiple different ways one they are active project delivery where they are 100% committed to a customer program second a part a significant part of that is also you know our consulting capability where we leverage them for the front end piece of work or for doing proof of concepts or for you know onshore related discussions and so on so forth so there will be some slack in the on site utilization compared to you know many of the other peers of ours who are basically into operations and so on the other part of it is there some you know due to be driven in terms of getting more utilization there yeah there could be a few percentage points there but we would focus more on the offshore utilization as well where we have built significant capability capacity and there is definitely level to do utilization improvement there so there will be improvement both sides but offshore will give us more onshore will definitely give us a few percentage points Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rahul Jain from Dolat Capital. Please go ahead. Ah, uh, yeah, hi. Uh, just, just wanted uh, uh, if you could share a little bit more color uh, in terms of the areas uh, wherein you expect this uh, growth in Alliance to uh, come back uh, to a much higher level from the recent past trend. So, any areas uh, you would like to specify? Sure. so if we look at the alliance business the largest customer of ours has reorganized their business in multiple different areas whether it is you know their hybrid cloud business whether it is their cloud tax for data security 
automation and so on. So if we look at it, we are well aligned to some of those businesses. We are seeing definitely an uptick, for example, in the security side, on the data side as well. And so it is more broad-based, but there are some pockets where we are more well entrenched, whether it is cloud and security and data, from that perspective. So those are the areas at a broader level that we will see the business you know, come up. And the second aspect of that would be as we do more business on those cloud packs, with our biggest customers, we would also be taking that to the market in our you know, customer base as well as newer customer base to be able to do the same with part as much as we do the same two part. So from that perspective, there are multiple levels of expansion that are available to us. Right, and and uh, given uh, these uh, these uh, situation, yeah, you think this is a a multi-year opportunity or this is what we are seeing uh, for the uh, near future but uh, we have to see as our things progress uh, beyond FR22. So this is definitely short to mid-term opportunity. Obviously this is an evolving market and we also have to see how all this evolves for our customers as well. But for the short to mid-term we are relatively confident of this approach. We have seen early successes and that is where the confidence that we have from Q1 onwards that we are saying that it will come to growth is reflected. So short to medium term, this is the strategy. Obviously, in technology world, you know, if you're looking for, you know, two to three years out, that is the best you can do and then you keep looking two to three years out every point in time. Right, right. I mean, uh, the reason uh, for asking that is, of course, uh, you know, how, how this segment has uh, performed over the last, uh, you know, couple of years. So. So uh, the, the the point is that is it is it a difficult business to scale? Uh, is that what I'm trying to understand? So every customer has a different you know profile. So from our perspective, if you look at the revenue concentration, we have brought down the revenue concentration because our other parts of business have been growing significantly higher percentage points. And the mix of this particular business in the overall business has been coming down. Given that, it is like a portfolio management. Overall, we believe our business will heavily grow. We will be in the top end of the growth in terms of the top quartile for the industry. Now, within that, some years, the alliance will grow a little higher, some years it will go a little bit lower. But on an overall portfolio basis, we are very you know, confident in terms of the other customers that we have and the portfolio spread of growth and so on and so forth. So, not a worry at the company level. Obviously, push and text will always be there at individual customer levels. Right. Yes. Got it. Thank you. That's it from my Thank you very much. Okay, I think we are at the end of time. Um, so we should try and close if there are no other questions. Yes, sir. We'll take that as the last question. I would now like to hand the conference back to Mr. Kalra for any closing comments. Yeah, so from our perspective, as I said, it was a fairly strong quarter and a fairly strong ending to the financial year 21. We are confident of our prospects in the coming year, and we remain you know, committed to delivering industry-leading growth, being in the top quarter. We would once again like to thank our 13,500 plus team members who made all this possible, our customers and partners who are with us on this journey and even in these hard times. We appreciate all of you spending time with us on this call today and we look forward to connecting back with you with the progress three months from now. Please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of Persistent Systems Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. You may now disconnect your lines.